All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion on the events depicted in the documentary At the Heart of Gold Inside the USA Gymnastics Scandal. My name is Maureen Weston. I'm professor of law and director of our sports and entertainment law program at Pepperdine Caruso School of Law, and also a proud member of the Sports Lawyers Association. I'd like to thank the Foundation for Global Sports Development, Sidewinder Films, the Sports Lawyers Association, and each of you today for helping make this event possible. At the Heart of Gold is a powerful documentary that tells of one of the most horrific abuse scandals in US sports history. Sexual abuse, abuse of power, abuse of trust of children. This film and our hope in this session today is to educate the public about the lesser known elements of abuse, especially when it occurs, occurs within a revered sports organization as depicted in the film. This film helps us realize the risks, what can go wrong and why it went wrong. This is a problem not only in gymnastics, but virtually every sport and every segment of society. Today, we'd like to focus on solutions and prevention. Many of you have seen the film and it's available on HBO. I'd like to provide a gentle content warning. The subject matter of today's discussion involves mention of sexual abuse, which is certainly disturbing and may be triggering to some. We encourage you to practice self-care during and after the session. Pepperdine University counselor Sophia Fang has joined our session and is available to anyone who may need to speak to a professional. So thank you for being here with us, Sophia. Her email address will be in the chat box along with several other resources, including Child Health and RAIN. It's my honor to introduce our esteemed panelists. Judge Rosemary Aquilina made history when she allowed 156 sister survivors and other victims to speak during the sentencing in the People versus Nassar case. She has served as a civilian judge for 17 years and was a practicing attorney for 16 years prior. Judge Aquilina was the first JAG officer in the Michigan Army National Guard, where she served honorably for 20 years. She's a published author of several novels and her memoir, Just Watch Me, was released last December as part of the first original series with Reese Witherspoon and Hello Sunshine. Judge Aquilina is a superstar. She has five children, three grandchildren, and resides in East Lansing, Michigan. We look forward to hearing from you, Judge. Thank Trine you. Gonzar is a survivor and advocate for victims of sexual abuse. As a former gymnast from Lansing, Michigan, and a survivor of the disgraced doctor, Trine's victim impact statement went global hours after she spoke. In addition to being featured in At the Heart of Gold, Trine has been featured in several books, podcasts, and panels. Trine spoke at both the 2019 and 2020 United Nations Survivor Town Hall with the group RISE in the hopes to help pass the Worldwide Survivor Bill of Rights. Trine currently serves as the Director of Development at Avalon Healing Center, where her focus is to raise awareness and bring attention to their important services. Trine is a graduate of Columbia College in Chicago with a BA in investigative journalism. She lives in Detroit with her son and two boys, Ashton and Lachlan. Mick Graywall is the founding manager and partner at Graywall Law Firm in Michigan. He graduated from the University of Michigan, Cooley Law School, and holds a Master of Laws in Taxation from John Marshall Law. Mick and his team represented 111 survivors in the lawsuit against Michigan State University. His legal team continues their battle for justice and change, representing 139 of the 543 survivors against USA Gymnastics and the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Mick is part of the legal team currently representing over 100 survivors of Robert Anderson at the University of Michigan. Passionate about helping people, Mick is on the board of nonprofit organizations, including Survivor Strong, Avalon Healing Center, and the City of Lansing's Community Corrections Advisory Board. Our moderator today is Jama Meyer. Jama is counsel at Simpson Thatcher Bartlett in New York City, where her focus is on antitrust and Title IX litigation. She is also a visiting clinical professor of sports law and public policy at Indiana University. And we welcome both the Pepperdine and Indiana students uh, joining us today, along with our SLA members. Jama advocates the power of sport to bring about social change with a special focus on achieving gender equality through sports, through education, activism, and litigation. Jama has written extensively on issues relating to college sports, including 
It's on the NCAA, a playbook for eliminating sexual assault. Jama is a member of the board of directors of the Sports Lawyers Association and on the Women's Sports Foundation. And in her younger years, Jama was a world-ranked swimmer. She's now a world-ranked lawyer. Jama will moderate our discussion with the panelists for about 45 minutes, then we will open to questions. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat or save until that segment of our session begins. Again, we thank you for joining us today. And Jama, thank you for moderating. Thank you so much, Maureen, for your much too kind comments. And I consider you one of my um, greatest mentors. Uh, you truly are a world-class professor. So, and also thank you panelists and thank you audience. We're so um, thrilled to be able to present this to you today. You know, when I was in law school and I was taking a trial course, I had a professor explain to me, quote, the best arguments in the world may not change a person's mind. The only reliable thing that can do that is a good story. And I would argue that stories come to life best through film. So it's through the lens of this heart-wrenching story, A Heart of Gold, from which we have learned so much. But at the onset, I would like to emphasize what Maureen already touched upon, that although we're talking mostly about problems in gymnastics today, this problem is not unique to gymnastics, not unique to women's sports, and not unique to sports. Indeed, it's estimated that one of four college women are sexually assaulted and up to 60% of women in the workplace are sexually assaulted. And most recently at the University of Michigan and at the Ohio State, hundreds and hundreds of men were abused by teen doctors. So today we're gonna to discuss how do we change the culture, the laws, the responsible persons and entities so that survivors will feel empowered to come forward so we will believe survivors and so there will be appropriate repercussions to the abusers. With that, I'd like to get started um, with what is a typical sexual predator? Um, either Mick or Judge, could you give us some background on the profile and the MO of a typical sexual predator and how we might tell that someone in our community is such a predator? I think first of all, first and foremost, uh, there are some typical procedures they use, but anybody can be a predator. So look at those people around you. It's not the homeless person. It could be the person who is the professor, who is the coach, who you most want to befriend. The homeless person might be just a person who looks grungy and is down on their luck. We can't put people in boxes and say that's a predator and that's not a predator. What we have to look for are certain behaviors such as, let's talk about grooming. Clearly, I hope that came out in the film. I think we all know what grooming is, but when I do these talks, I'm always surprised that people don't really know what grooming is. I think it's self-evident in this, but grooming is a process uh, where an adult establishes an emotional connection with a child in order to abuse the child. And there's certain behaviors that are always used and maybe not each and every one of them, but there are things like singling out the child as special, isolating the child, pushing the boundaries. We see that I think very clearly in the film where Nasser's touching the girls and then he's touching them in closer and closer to their breasts, their crotch, what have you. And I think if you would not know the facts of this, you might say, well, that's okay, he's a doctor. It's not okay what he did. Befriending the family, befriending um, the friends of the child, giving gifts. And that was clearly something that happened in this case. When an adult who's not a relative, a close family friend is giving gifts, who's being alone with a child who's saying, don't tell or else, those are all signs. Those happen all around us. You have to look for bruises, um, clothing that might not be appropriate. In the summertime, there might be a turtleneck or long sleeves or somebody who doesn't normally wear a hat wearing a hat because there was an assault and there was some kind of violence associated with it. Nasser wasn't that kind of predator, but there are so many signs and it depends on the predator, but ultimately they all 
uh, go through this sort of tension building and this um, kind of explosion when the when the uh, victim says, well, it, I don't understand what you're doing. And then there's, oh, this is perfectly all right. And there's a lot of trust building and, and pulling back and forth. And we saw a lot of that with Nasser. And then, of course, he gets to explain what he's doing because he's gaslighting everybody into believing, which is a form of emotional abuse, into believing that the, the victim's wrong and he's right. And these are all signs that are very common regardless of the abuser. I would like to add that there really is no typical predator. The predator is your nice, nice person neighbor. I mean, look at Nasser, look at Anderson, look at Tyndall, look at these people that abuse their positions of authority and trust. When you have trust, whether it's a physician, a coach, a neighbor, a parent, an uncle, they abuse that position to groom the child or the person to gain their trust so eventually that they won't tell. And now we're seeing because of people like Trine, the ability for survivors to come forward and speak and they are being believed. And this is the phenomenon that we're seeing right now. Survivors are being believed. So these predators that are out there and they're everywhere, they better watch out because we believe now. Excellent. And the sad fact is, and Trine was, you were part of, right, the first group. And if, and there were complaints back then. And, it, it, you know, what I kept hearing as each one of them came forward was I've told, I told someone they didn't believe me. And if one person, one person way back then, what, 25, 30 years ago would have believed hundreds, maybe thousands would have been saved. You have to believe a child. Well, I'm just going to add to that. In the work that I do now, most people think that the van, the white van driving down the street or the very obvious predator is who's, who's the problem. It's statistically proven much more often than not, it's somebody that's close to you and your family. So I feel like that misconception of the white van or the person in the alley, um, it's much more often not that. Yeah, it's not like in the movies. It's yeah. really, it's somebody you know and somebody you trust. Yes. Well, we, we touched upon um, a few a little bit of Larry Nassar and his techniques, his grooming techniques here. Do any of you have anything to add particularly about him? And how was he able to make the girls believe that his, his actions were appropriate? And how was this hidden for so long, this veil of secrecy from other in gymnasts, from parents, and from, you know, entities, coaches that should have been on top of this? Well, he used the fact that he tried to say he was doing a legitimate medical procedure on everybody. So you have to understand the children, the gymnasts, the young girls, they were listening to their coaches and the coaches believed that this was a legitimate medical procedure. And then you take it a step further, when some of the parents were in the room when this invasive assault was going on they thought this procedure was normal their daughters are looking at them and the daughters are looking at their parents thinking my mom and dad is inside in the room right there so everything must be okay so nasser got off on this i mean he he escalated over time and if you want to go back all the way to 1997 which i think was the first time that it was reported to coach kathy clages the head gymnastics coach at Michigan State. She was informed of this, but instead of believing the children victims, she believed Larry Nasser. In fact, she took it so far that she believed him and went back to him and told him that one of my students came forward and said, this is happening. And he said he would take care of it and discuss it with that student. And she was re-victimized and re-traumatized hundreds of times. So you well, found let me... Let me just jump in because I feel like giving an exact image of how it really happened. Um, in our gym, we had a back room that was Larry's room. And this room had doors with windows. And the windows were covered with towels and or pieces of paper. And we weren't, parents didn't go back there, but that's where all of our 
treatments were done by him. So first red flag is that, I mean, if, if there's a space that children are being treated. So for me, it started when I was eight. So I had no idea at a, as an eight-year-old child what was medical and what was not. I would never question strep throat if they're giving me amoxicillin for that. I would never question that the doctor is giving me that and I need to ask my mom if that's what I should be taking. So as an eight-year-old, I just was under the impression that that's what needed to be done. Now, with that being said, the space that I was in, I was made a perfect ally of his because this treatment was being done to me so often and because this treatment was told to me that it was medical when other teammates and, and people in my community in the gymnastics community came to me and said, this is happening to me. And I, I over and over said, oh, that's, it's happening to me all the time. So you're okay. It's going to be okay. We're, I, we're all getting it apparently at this, in this space. So that started that conversation of it being a medical treatment. Nobody asked questions. It was just happening. And then in the same space, as a 16 year old, I'm getting my car keys. Now I'm able to go to the doctor's appointments by myself because that's a step easier for a parent. So I'm going to those doctor's appointments because it's Larry. How many times it's just because it was Larry. We, I, I saw him every day for five, five days a week for years. So just to put a little bit of concept of really how it happened and what he did and how good he was at years and years and years of grooming and intentionality of making specific one, ones of us his allies. Well, they really had co-conspirators because like Larissa Boyce compl uh, complained and said, this is wrong. I know it's wrong. And Clay just said, well, okay. And if we complain, we can do that, but your teammates will suffer and you will suffer. And he's a good doctor. And this is medical and, 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 and she was gaslighted and it was allowed to continue. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just him because he was a doctor. He also was the Olympic doctor. Yes. That prestige that he was the one everybody wanted to be seen by him. So yes. as the judge said, I mean, he gaslighted everybody. Of course, all the victims, all the parents. But when the coaches were told, they didn't want to believe. And that's the sad part in our society and what we're trying to change. We have to believe. And well, and nobody has, yeah. Sorry, and law, sorry. I'm no, sorry, Trinae. Well, I just want to add to what uh, Mick was saying because law enforcement was also groomed. Mm -hmm. They, in fact, used, which it just blows me away because I see evidence every day. Mick presents evidence every day, and it blows me away that law enforcement believed the person who was accused and used his expert. It doesn't, grooming doesn't get better than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's done this for so many years. He bamboozles and grooms the parents, the children, law enforcement, um, Michigan, everybody at Michigan State, the people he worked with. I don't know if there's anybody that um, Mick or Trinae, you know, that he didn't groom. No, but that's part of the problem, Judge, is that right. those people believed him over the victim survivors when in fact, you have to go outside of the university or outside of the organization to report. I mean, I know part of this conversation today is gonna to be about safe sport, but the problem when you report to yourself, <laughs> there's no honesty there. Yeah. So he's, he's using his own experts, the authorities are believing him and discounting what all these young children were saying. That's not right. Right. And it seems like here um, the, the victims were being retaliated against by those to whom they reported and even, you know, questioned by their parents and having then problems with their parents it, for those that were willing to come forward and say something. Um, to, to, Naya, you mentioned red flags. Were there any other red flags that come to mind? Well, first off, I mean, he he was the nice guy. Everyone loved him. It was a space that, like everyone has already said, he, he was so trusted in our community, nobody questioned anything. So when people did question, there was like almost as if they were crazy. So, I, I mean, the way that the bag, the massive bag that he carried, I don't, I, and those had the towels that he put up. So he, he brought his own towels in his red, in his giant Olympic bag. Um, you know, he, 
I mean, there's so many different states of, of who Larry was that it almost makes it he's like that sociopath that you can't believe that he had so many different persons once you step back and really realize. Um, but really, it was so good. At, he was perfecting who he was to make all of us trust him. I think Trené, when she she was really the the one that got him to cry, you could just feel he actually felt when she spoke. And I think the my I'm so vivid in terms of uh, what I remember about you, Trené, which is um, my friend, what have you done? It was almost biblical the way she said it. And it was it just cut to the core, I think, in the heart of everybody, but especially him, because they, they had. And you, obviously, Trina, you should speak to this, the friendship that had been developed over the yeah. years, and it took you a long time even to accept and to unwind the years of grooming, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it literally started when I was eight. So I, he was our trainer before he was our doctor. He, he was in med school. In fact, that's how we ended up having his wife who became our trainer in lieu of him going to med school. And that's how they met. So that, I mean, there were steps and steps and steps that integrated in our, in my family that even when people like Brie Randall or Larissa Boyce were coming forward, myself and my family and all these other people in our community were stopping gasping, like there's no way. And as a 37 year old woman, my mom asked me, did that happen to you? And I looked at her and lied directly to her face and said, no. And here I know at 37, this happened to me hundreds of times. And it's such an embarrassing space. It's such a degrading space when you start realizing uh, uh, what has happened. I mean, even today, there's so many things that are still happening right now that I look back in my childhood and I can't believe how much really happened in my childhood that is, is where I am now because it wasn't a horrible time. Gymnastics itself as a sport, there's so many broken, broken levels of what, what that sport is. But looking back at it, I mean, we were, we were ground zero for this. We had the John Getterts, we had the Larry Nassars. I mean, we had the law enforcement that wasn't believing. We had doctors that were siding. We had MSU that was enabling all of this. I mean, really, it's just mind blowing how many spaces failed us. Well, hundreds of us going what gives you the courage to do a panel like today because she's wonderful well, you know i work in sexual violence now and i recognize my privilege in in my case so i understand that my case is not how most cases happen most if i can give one survivor a voice today or one person in this conversation today to take a step back either to to look in their own community versus they have to be a resource in Philadelphia or in Atlanta, wherever they are, but also to make a little bit of change. If we're, if we're going in the right direction, I'm willing to stand here and be that survivor space. Well, we, we have to start, the so to start here. So, so fortunate that we have people like you willing to put yourself out that way. Thank you so much. Um, let's move to the proceeding a little bit. Um, and, and maybe Mick, you can tell us, we've talked about this veil of secrecy, why it was able to prevail. What broke that? What caused, you know, whether the investigative journalism or the discovery of incriminating evidence, can you walk us through how we got to where we were in, in 2017, 2018 with, with um, knowledge about what Larry Nassar had done? Well, it all started in 2016 with the Indy Star that was doing a comprehensive investigative journalism piece. And Rachel Den Hollander came forward and spoke to them about what occurred with her. And when her story hit the paper, I mean, I'm not going to speak for Trinae, even though I've got to know her quite well, but all the gymnasts out there were read, read what happened to Rachel and they said, this happened to me too. So there was a, I mean, there was a trickle that turned into a waterfall that just came raging down that all these young women over decades were abused. And eventually, I mean, this was late 2016. I think the first lawsuit was filed in 2017. And we started with maybe, I don't know, 10 to, 10 to 18 
people that had the courage to come forward to begin with. By the time that year ended, there were 333 survivors that had come forward, all with similar stories, all who were groomed, all over time, many of which reported to Michigan State University, reported to Meridian Township Police Department, reported to other authorities and coaches and trainers. But eventually, one of the victim survivors, and I don't want to say her name because I, I don't remember if she's public right now, but she reported to Detective Munford that there was some issues going on with regard to what Larry Nasser had, and they executed a search warrant. And in that search warrant, they took his trash and they found tens of thousands of pictures of child pornography. And I think once he was, once he was charged with that, that opened the floodgate that people actually started believing that, oh my God, Larry Nasser had child pornography. Maybe these women and girls are telling the truth. But really, to me, the biggest watershed moment, Jama, was when Judge Aquilina, or God bless her, when she allowed every single one of these victims to come forward to speak. And she does that all the time, but she let over 100 of them speak. And sitting there for six days, six of the seven, you could see what was going on. And I mean, I'll have the judge speak at that moment, but that was the watershed moment. And, and maybe I would love to hear what you have to say in response to that judge, but can you include in there, um, especially for this audience, that the proceeding was not a trial that we witnessed in the film. It was a sen sentencing um, hearing. And can you explain sort of the differences and what's, why that's important here and, and the significance? Yeah. Yeah, so I've come under fire because, you know, and it's something I've always done. I've been a judge now for 17 years. I always let everybody speak and I always speak to them. But there's a huge difference when I do that. At a jury trial, the jury decides what the facts of the case are and I decide the law. And if they decide guilty, then I go to sentencing later. He was set to go to trial and I had the attorneys in my office several times. I had issued gag orders. We had special questionnaires because we were trying to get a clean jury and it was so widely uh, known. I had called in 800 jurors. The first 200 were set to come in and his attorneys showed up and said, after they had many times convinced me, they said, uh, they both had experts because I asked, how long will this take? You know, what experts, all of that. They were... I was told without hesitation that the people had experts saying this was not medical and that defense had experts saying it was medical. So I thought, you know, hallelujah, this is going to be so not, not to, because of the victims or any of that, but just legally in my mind, I'm saying, okay, this is going to be terribly fascinating because it's going to be a cross between a medical malpractice and a criminal case. And if you sit in trials, as we all do, those are very interest, interesting in terms of legal and testimony and, you know, the posturing. And so it's this movie unfolding. Well, they set it for trial and the attorneys came in and said, he'd like to plead. Will you allow him to plead? And here's the, the deal. And so I said, okay, but it has to be the day before Thanksgiving. That was um, because we were set on the following week to start with jury selection. And they said, well, okay, there were 29 counts. He's going to plead to seven first degree criminal sexual conduct. We'll dismiss the rest and we will not issue on the child pornography that was found on his personal phone. And I said, okay. And the plea agreement was going to be that I could sentence anywhere between 25 to 40 on the minimum. And then I would determine the maximum. And then the people said, and in one other case, we've let, you know, more than the, those who uh, counts who are pled to testify. And I said, that's not an issue. I never put a limit. And so I'm going to let everybody. And then there was some discussion because the doctor who referred him a lot of people were wanted to testify and some others in defense said, look, we don't think that's right. And I said, then go ahead and appeal me. I always do this. It's not an issue. Ultimately, it, because it was a plea, which was then set. And he, by the way, he wanted the plea to be set um, after the sentencing in the federal court. And I said, no, it's going to be now. And the reason they wanted that is because it's, it's a strategic move because then the 
federal judge would not have known that he was going to plead guilty, would not have been able to consider that. She did consider it. She also said that this was some of the worst child pornography she'd ever seen. So she sentenced him to 20 plus 20 plus 20. Then it comes to me, um, he, he pled. So I had set that out for January when we were going to start the trial without a limit to the number of people who would speak. Initially, there was going to be about six who were going to use their name and the rest were not going to use their name. I had heard there were going to be about 20, then 40, then it was about 80. And in the people's written plea agreement, they said about 125 would testify. And I had said, well, that's, that's not my agreement. That's yours. I never put a limit. So ultimately, I ended up listening to 169, 156. I dubbed sister survivors because as Trené can tell you, I was watching it from the bench. She was in the back. But one came, one would come up and testify. And then I would talk to them. And then the next. And you could see them healing and forming this bond. They sort of came uh, very scared and sort of small and they grew and grew and grew. Trine included, she grew into this enormous person saying, I'm mad at you, my friend. And they all did that. And it was so healing. And then you started seeing groups of girls who had never met before, but who had suffered at his hands coming up and supporting each other. And just the, obviously the difference between a uh, uh, plea, which is what I heard and I was now sentencing, is that under the Crime Victims Rights Act, I can listen to victims. And I always comment because I use the power of the robe to give the victim hopefully words of wisdom aimed at them so that they don't feel shamed or blamed, that they know how powerful and how strong it is and how important it is for not only themselves, but others. And that's really what transpired. Now, he wasn't happy about that. He's appealed me, he's appealed me now again to the Supreme Court because he thinks I was too mean to him. But you know, this isn't the time to hand him a bouquet of roses and say, okay, thanks for being the largest pedophile we've ever seen and for not uh, still owning that this was not treatment. He still says it's treatment. He thinks it was um, at most malpractice. He's never owned it. And my anger was because he was in front of the people who testified so bravely, all 169, 156 sister survivors. He was laughing, making jokes with his lawyers, writing things, not paying attention. And if you listen, if you go back, probably over half of them said, look at me when I talk, listen to me, because he wasn't taking it seriously. And then he wrote me that letter. Hell hath no woman like a, hell hath no scorn like a, hell hath no fury like a woman scorn. See, I'm still this upset about it. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, which really said to me, I don't care about any of you women. It's all about me. You are nothing. And that really cheesed me off. Actually, I mean, one point that the judge made was that he agreed to allow all these victim survivors to come forward. But when he started to hear it, he didn't like it. And that's why he wrote that letter to her. And I still remember that day when she, when she came down, he actually, she gave him an opportunity to withdraw his plea and he didn't want to do it. Right. And the day Trine came and spoke, I was sitting behind her and everybody in the gallery could see it was the only time that Larry cried. And I actually think it's because how much he groomed her, he acknowledged the fact that he remembered her. Out of all of them, he remembered her. I think that's the only time he showed emotion. Yeah. And countless uh, women said, I am not, because they weren't going to use their names. I am not a number. I am a name and I'm mad. And it really was such a turning point. And he couldn't handle that all of these women now were in control and he no longer had control. And if you really watch, and over those seven days, Trine was there, Mick was there, the people who were there, they will tell you that he kept trying to get control. And I wasn't having any of that. But that's really typical behavior of pedophiles. Mm -hmm. Trine, can also, you yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was, all I was going to say is... Um, I did watch for the days leading up to, and I was Jane Doe B43 until about two hours before I spoke. And the reason I decided to speak um, was that I recognized if he didn't react to me, he was already dead. So like the person I was watching for those days, this like shell of a person, he wasn't 
that wasn't the Larry that I knew. So if I went up and he didn't have any reaction to me that he was already a dead person and this was a waste, all of it was a waste because he was already gone. And what happened with me was actually Larry showing up for a moment in time and recognizing that this is not where I want to be. I don't want to be having to have this conversation and I don't even want it to be him. That's the person on the other side, but it is. And this is real life. And this was my life. And now this is 500 and some other ladies sitting here and he's not even giving the time of day. And I just couldn't keep going with that if he wasn't going to, I mean, he literally would just like Judge Aquilina said, talk to his attorney, turn back, kind of put his head in his face. And it's funny because I didn't know Judge Aquilina. And to be honest with you, I was terrified of her. Um, she's like this big and she's like this, this big though. But you walk in and you're in front of a judge. I've never been in front of a judge before. And I remember her when I'm doing my impact statement, looking at me and then looking at him and then looking back at me and looking back at him because this was the first time he was actually human. He was finally presenting as the person that I knew. The other piece to that, Renee, maybe you can address, I don't mean to take over your questioning, but the oh, other yeah. really um, impactful point was that, you know, the parents, people can blame the parents all they want, but they truly didn't know they were groomed. They were yeah. shielded, all these things. And Renee's mom came up. And of course, I always have, you know, there's the Crime Victims Rights Act. I read it so broadly, and I will continue to do that and fight for the right to do that. But Trinae's mom is a great example of the rippling effect of crime. She was there and she was just shaking and she said, Your Honor, may I speak? And I let her speak. And it was so, it, I think she spoke really for the other voices, which is the parents, um, the loved ones of all of these girls. And she was so broken and, and heartfelt that she led her daughter into this monster's hand. Right, Trinae? Yes, she, I mean, my mom, Bill, I, I mean, I, I think if we all just take a step back, people parent shame, it's your worst nightmare as a parent, this exact situation. So as my mom standing there, having to look at our friend who we sat at his wedding, I have been in his office hundreds of times. He's been at my family's home. We've had lots of dinners. I've been to his home, you know, all these things of, and then that's who we're having to talk to. It is, it is your absolute worst nightmare as a parent. And the parents. It doesn't get worse. Speaking of par parents, right, what happened in Judge Cunningham's uh, courtroom? With well, the for, first in general, is that the parents, they have so much guilt because they took yes. their child to this pedophile. And they think that they should have noticed this was going on, but yes. he perfected his grooming. Mm -hmm. He perfected mm -hmm. how this happened. So, I mean, we had parent groups I mean, every day in front of Judge Aquilina, we were waiting for something to happen because, I mean, fathers and mothers hearing for the first time yes. that this happened. But part two of this case took place in Eaton County, where he was also sentenced. And in front of Judge Cunningham, one of the parents who had three daughters who were sexually assaulted, all three were my clients, he heard for the first time what happened to his daughters. And he basically asked Judge Cunningham, can I have five minutes alone with them? Just like any father would do. If not five minutes, yeah. can I have one minute? And after, that, after she said no, which she should have, he lunged for Larry and a little chaos ensued. But that was the anger and that was the emotion that was in Judge Aquilina's courtroom every day. That was in Judge Cunningham's courtroom every day. This is what's been bottled up for all the survivors and all the parents and the family and loved ones they, they, they're hurting too, Jama, they're hurting. And, you know, in, in the end, as a society, the goal here is that we have to educate our children, our neighbors, our friends to honestly look out for themselves because these adults in the room and these institutions aren't doing their job. Yeah. I just want to add on that that fight did not happen in my courtroom. I had set my courtroom up. Um, I had plain clothes when I met with law enforcement. I did a lot of military strategic things because I'm military. I'm trained in terrorism, and I figured something like that would happen in my courtroom. Nothing against Judge Cunningham, but 
I also want you all to know, because it's important, I have to be fair to both sides. I didn't just want to protect the girls and the people who were in the courtroom. I also had to protect him. I anticipated that someone would want to run at him. Someone might bring a, a weapon or whatever. So I had met with law enforcement and said, I want to put him in the witness chair. So for the ease of the girls, so they wouldn't have to turn around, but also because if something happened, you must immediately take him through the back door. So this was also, I know I've been criticized, but you know, that the fact is he was in that seat for a lot of reasons, including his protection. I don't want people to think that I'm just mean against all predators, but you know, the problems he caused in the courtrooms, the stress his, were his attitude and his, um, his own issues. I think that the lawyers did their job. I think we, as a court, did our job. Uh, the sister survivors and their families were, everyone was appropriate, um, but you could feel that tension. And just as a side note, I wish there were cameras in every case because it's, I think it's the, the watchdog of our society and we get that information, but the stories were so compelling, so heartfelt that, and I had, I don't know how many cameras, multiple cameras and cameramen. For those seven days, there was not one cameraman's eyes that were dry. They literally stood in silent with tears running down their face for seven days. And I don't think I had any female uh, camera people. They were all males. And this is how gut-wrenching it was. And they've seen it all. But that gave everybody an opportunity, honestly, to heal a little bit. And you can actually see, Judge, the victims that came after, I mean, after your case, after the civil suit settled, they did not get their day in court. They did not get their day to confront Larry. And even in like in my Michigan case, where the defendant perpetrator, predator is deceased, they are not gonna get that day. And that's missing, but over here, that's why I call that the watershed moment. That's what happened where the whole world got to see what was going on and how these women were affected. And now they're finally being believed. And obviously the whole world would not have seen that if there had not been cameras in the room. So great decision. Um, is there anything that the film did not cover that you wish it could have included with more time or anything that the film just couldn't capture in the courtroom of significance? You know, I think part of what wasn't captured were the things that attorneys and lawyers do like in my chambers, like the discussion about who's gonna testify, like the plea agreement, um, those kinds of conversations. And I can tell you, and actually Trinae should tell you cause I've only heard it second and third hand, but the girls all hated me at first because of the gag order. And I had to issue that. And we had conversations in chambers that are not on the record about how, you know, that I was going to do it and what was the form of it. And I was told point blank, the girls want you off the case, they hate you. And I said, well, that's okay. I have to have a clean jury because there is, you know, justice has to be equalized. I need a fair and impartial jury. This is the only way I can do it. And so there were really, I don't know if it comes through in the movie, but both sides hated me. And then, you know, I always figure that, when both sides hate you, you did something right. <laughs> so as I know the girls were upset about the gag order, right? Well, it wasn't just the girls, Judge. We actually fought you on the gag order too. Yes, you did. <laughs> because we believe that every victim should have their opportunity to go speak and tell their story. Now, yeah. what you had to do is different than what we had to do. Yes, mm -hmm. everybody has a different job and for different reasons. And you know, where was I ever going to get a clean jury if everybody was out there talking? Can you, you, you understand gag orders so well, can you for this audience explain wh what the gag order did, what the scope of it was and how long it lasted? So the, the, we need to have a fair and impartial jury in every case. So when you have a high profile case and people are talking about it, and of course the media wants that on the front page of every newspaper of every magazine because it sells, it makes money. And the problem with that is more and more people read it and hear about it on the various platforms. So I issued a gag order for any of the people who were associated with the case in front of me that they could not talk about the case. The first order was a bit too broad and the lawyers came to me, Mick, and people came to me and said, well, you just can't say everybody. So we fine tuned it. But having, if that would not have been in place, I think, and if he wanted a jury, 
trial. Um, I think it would have been months to get uh, a clean jury and we would have had pages and pages of more questions to ask. And in fact, the usual process is, and hopefully everybody who's listening who's uh, over 18 has had a, a jury summons. You fill out a questionnaire, you get a summons, you send it back. Well, we didn't just do that. We had prepared about seven or eight pages of additional questions so that once the jurors came in, they would sit for a day, fill out the questionnaire, and then the attorneys and I would go through it and say, who's coming back? There's a yes pile, a hell no pile, and a maybe pile. And then that way, out of the 800 and possibly more jurors, we would be able to get maybe 100 jurors to be the panel to voir dire to go to trial. The gag order stops the chatter so that we can get to the truth of the matter and the jury doesn't take what the newspaper says or what the radio says into the jury box because that is hearsay. We have to have the truth in the jury room and we can't have them talking about what they might have heard and what they uh, what opinion they formed. And as much as voir dire, which means to speak the truth, as much as voir dire can be done, you always worry, what is someone not saying? Is someone, did someone hear something and they just think, well, that won't affect me, but ultimately it does in their decision-making. And that's not justice. Right. And one, of the things, one of the things I wish the film did talk about yeah. was the relationships that these survivors built with each other and the strength that they shared with each other. Because early on, even before the, as the criminal case was proceeding in the civil case, we brought seven survivors together. And for the first time, they all talked, and Trinae was one of them. They talked and they couldn't believe that what happened to them happened to their sister right next to them. And that, that encouraged a little bit the strength for them. And the film didn't show that, but there's relationships still to this day that they have. I mean, these sister survivors, they all love each other. <laughs> more moving things I've seen is when the sister survivors were able to come together, almost 200 of them, I think, at the ESPYs, and they were awarded as a group um, the Arthur Ashe Award. But Trinae, I know you weren't able to be there. Can you share with us why and, and then what you did? How you did that? <laughs> I, I was giving birth. Um, while all the ladies were filing on stage, um, I, I was giving, I was in labor for about 40 hours before I gave birth. And I sat there after, as they're about taking me to the uh, C-section um, because we were starting to have heart rates drop and things like that. And I said, I've waited 40 hours to give birth. I just want to watch this one thing on TV. Can you give me five minutes to just watch my fellow teammates and sister survivors and and place I want to be so badly can I just watch this and they said no <laughs> so they wheeled me back to the c-section I was just absolutely hysterical an hour later we get into the recovery room but um, I had some things happen to me they had to give me some strong medicine and we had several names listed that we were going to name our child, not one of them being Ashton, Ash. And my husband, he really had this intention after the, in recovery that he wanted to name our child before we uh, announced or before we let anyone back. And he kept saying, I think he's Ash. I think he's Ash. I think he's, I think he's from the Arthur Ash. And I'm and him. I am so drugged right now. If you mess this up and if you pick a name I hate, we get to change it when I come out of this. End. And and now we have Ashton, who is <laughs> Ash. And he he it was our courage um, through all of this and and really uh, a powerful a powerful moment for me that I I didn't get to be part of. Well, I'm but so they were all messaging me. <laughs> while it was happening, because I went silent for a certain amount of time. I think even Judge Aquilina, everyone knows I'm in labor and they're all at this major award and they're all messaging my husband. We haven't heard from her, what's going on, freaking out. And I'm like, you guys focus on the ESPYs, it's fine. I'll just give birth. Yeah, we were all talking about what's going on. And I have to say at the ESPYs, um, you know, I was on the fence about whether I should go. And then people like Trinae said, you have to go. And Trinae's like, I can't go. You have to be there. And so, and yeah. it was really an honor that they included me. But I have to say that the 
fortunate thing was the night before the ESPYs, there was a practice. And I think without that practice, everybody would have been jello and just sort of fallen off the stage because it was so sure. impactful to see everybody up there. And, you know, I've seen a lot of horrific things. This was horrifying by numbers, but I've seen, you know, women thrown downstairs, breasts cut, all sorts of hor horrid things on the bench. And so I didn't get emotional until I, I was there. And then I saw these beautiful souls all standing together and it just took my breath away the strength the beauty the perseverance um the hope that i think they gave in that moment to the world that i did this and so you can too and what it really did is change when if you come into my courtroom and you now watch any victim not just a rape but even of a home invasion so many people have watched and, and they write letters now. We don't have to tell them it's best if you write a letter in case you can't read it. They write a letter, they come forward and they're doing it in the same style and grace as the sister survivors. And so this has impacted the world in multiple, multiple ways. And in that moment is when I saw it because I thought this case would really just be like any other two days later, go away. But in that moment, that was really my first realization that this is a moment. And some of the survivors in my Anderson case right now, the men, they remember these moments that the sister survivors went through. And they've told me they've come forward because they saw the strength and courage that happened when Trinae and her sisters came forward. So, I mean, there's right now 850 survivors in the Anderson case. Wow. It's already dwarfed Nasser and predominantly men, athletes, and they look up to them. Right. They're encouraged by them. So you're having survivors encourage other survivors. And this is the change that Trine and all her sisters have done. Right. Very proud. I want to give the audience time to ask questions, but just two quick things. One, I, I would have loved to have time to talk about the failures by so many entities and individuals. Because you had Michigan State, you had USA Gymnastics, U.S. Olympics, um, committee, um, Congress, um, there was civil and criminal, you know, FBI, police, <laughs> the FBI, who, which was then investigated by DOJ for their um, failures. Um, but I think what I'd like to do, I just want everyone to be aware that unbelievable number of people either were told about this or somehow failed um, and were working hard to. Um, correct those failures, but we still have a long way to go. And maybe we can come back to this at the end if we don't have too many questions. But the, the one other thing I would definitely like just to mention is, as you've talked about, Mick, this is not a problem just for women. This is, um, you know, men are, are sexually abused too. But on, on the other side of the coin, I also want to make the point, and I know you all believe in this, and I'd like to hear from you about it, that men are a really important part of the solution here. Um, and and I rem it reminds me of um, Joe Biden, when he was vice president, had this campaign called It's On Us. And at my school at Indiana University at the basketball games on the Jumbotron, you'd have the president of the university and the star athletes get up and you know talk about it's on us, we wanna do something here. But can, can you just um, explain and encourage men to step up and what they can do to be part of the solution here? Well, First of all, I, go ahead, Mick. Well, I, what I want to say is that, you know, survivors are our fathers, our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, our uncles, our aunts. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason. And it, it frustrates me to no end when I look at different states and different areas when you think that this is a partisan matter. This is a non-partisan matter. This is a, not a sexist matter that it deals with men or women. It's across the board. Everybody can help. Everybody should step forward and help to change the culture, including men. And, you know, sadly, in this day and age, we're seeing it change, but men had the position of power. And because they had the position of power, they had to make the changes. You know, we're trying to make changes at the USAG, USOC level. We're trying to make changes in the state of Michigan right now. I know other states have already made changes, but men have to do it just as these sister survivors have done it. 
and some men are doing it, don't get me wrong. It's happening, but it's a slow change. Well, it's a simple yeah, change to your friends, your person, your life, your your buddies. It's, it's as simple as holding those people accountable. I mean, those are very uncomfortable moments when you have to see someone close to you talking about a butt or grabbing a butt or doing something extremely inappropriate and holding that person accountable that's in your community or your circle. So and you have to be informed mind. like Trine, she her organization came to my office and trained everybody to make sure everybody's yes. trauma informed. Even I was very careful when I spoke to the 111 survivors I represented by Nasser, you know, you don't want to re-traumatize them. And then when you take another look at the Anderson case, some of these people don't want to talk to a man of what happened to them. Or the women don't want to talk to a man or woman. You got to be very sensitive to their needs. We really need to partner with men because this isn't a woman's problem. And mm -hmm. if we don't partner together, we're never going to solve it. And I know you started out this with some statistics, but essentially every 73 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. It doesn't say American woman. It's an American. So we're looking at one out of every six American women being raped and one out of every 33 men being raped or attempted rape. And the fact of the matter is I have seen rape victims, male rape victims in my courtroom, but not very many. And we really need to stop and analyze this rape culture and get rid of it because when you know, men are, there's pressure on men to score. There's pressure on women to not be cold. And we really need to start this from the time there are babies saying, you know, you have informed consent. You can tell the doctor no, or I'm, you can't give me that shot until um, we need to teach boys and girls. It's not okay. It's, we don't tell them. We should never tell a child, a girl or a boy, oh, that boy hit you because he likes you or that girl, you know, yanked on your sleeve or bruised you or hit you with the swing because she likes you. What message is that? That's sending a message from a very young age that it's okay to assault each other because that's how we like each other. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And you look at even the boys will be boys. Right. I mean, that rape culture, there's so many pieces of it that you don't realize that are so ingrained and in in our culture because it's what we grew up with but to change that it's not boys will be boys that behavior is not it's 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 taught essentially that it's acceptable but yeah, we can't we can't shame people we can't say well why were you wearing that honey um why were yeah. you there alone at night those are that's an inappropriate i say we retire the why question because why shames and blames by its very nature and, you know, I always ask, what would you like me to know and how can I help? And then we're going to get a lot more of the story. And we need to also stop putting time limits on victims. They need to be survivors and thrivers in their own space, not your space. And there is no shame in going backward and forward in your healing because that's part of the trauma. We need to um, be trained by trauma-informed people like uh, Trine, but also if you're out there and you've been assaulted, you don't want to come forward, then you need to find a trauma-informed therapist. Some are better than others and make sure that they are trauma-informed, that they do understand what you're going uh, through. And while other people shouldn't put a time limit on your healing, you shouldn't put a time limit on your healing. Don't shame and blame yourself. You need to first be your own friend your own supporter, your own superhero, and then get rid of the people who don't support you. The world is a big place. There are a lot of people you can find who will support you. Get rid of the others. And when someone shames or blames you, delete, no, and walking away is a good thing to do. And also, and remember, also go ahead. Go ahead, Mick. <laughs> we could go in circles, all three yeah. of us. We speak right. this like day in and day out. Go ahead, Mick. Well, I was just trying to say, everybody knows what PTSD is, but I also am a firm believer of PTG or post-traumatic growth. I told all my clients and I have personal relationships with all of them right now that this whole process, as the judge said, is a healing process. It doesn't happen overnight. Everybody heals on their own time frame. It could take weeks, months, years. And this journey is a journey that there's going to be ups and downs. But as a society, we got to stop putting medals, dollars, everything above our kids and above yes. 
victims. We have to believe them, listen to them and believe because that's what they want. Somebody wants to tell their story. You sit and listen. You don't judge, you listen. Also, and I'm just going to put this out there to anyone on this. If you have been assaulted, most of us think in our mind, it was just me. It just happened to me. It likely I did something, you know, you go into this headspace of it was just me. I, I must have done something. Most predators are serial. And we are finding that through all of the studies and education we're doing in, in the organization such as mine, we are recognizing that they are serial. So if in your mind you think it just happened to me, there's likely about five other people in that circle from with that person that also think they just did it to me. Right. Yeah, I think just Harvey putting Weinstein. that out there. Yeah. The Harvey we need to yes. make, make sure people are reporting, you know, don't take no for an answer. Don't worry about how the school or the coach or the gym is going to feel about you. If you were wrong, mm -hmm. go through the prop, proper channels. If it's at school, there's Title IX, report to law enforcement, dial 911. If law enforcement, it's your right to make a police report. If they don't listen to you, go to the attorney general, uh, go to a different uh, police department, uh, call the mm -hmm. FBI if it crosses borders. A demand if go to an emergency room, they have to document it. Uh, hopefully that there'll be a rape kit done and then demand that that rape kit, you keep on top of that. It should be, you know, COVID, I can get a COVID test responded in 15 minutes and that's the quick test, not as reliable, but the other one, what, in 24 or 48 hours? Why is it mm -hmm. taking months to have rape kits? That should be legislated. You are all voters, ask Look who you're voting for, judges, um, local officials, senators, uh, representatives, governor, who, president, see what they're going to do. They should pass meaningful legislation to stop the epidemic of sexual assault, put money behind the rape kits, and let's put an end to this. They haven't done it because it's not popular. We need to talk and tell them we have power with our voice and with our vote, and we're not going to get softer we are in fact going to get louder right we're going to join together and stop this you know the, that is such such great advice um I, I don't want to run i i want to give students and the audience time to ask some questions and maureen's going to take over with those questions okay. thank you um we're all we need to take a breath because it's just been so powerful hearing from you all and thank you for the work that you're doing um, educating on this. I want to make sure we answer this question and you've, we've touched on it, but Trine, particularly from your perspective, the statistics on sexual abuse are staggering and those are the statistics that are reported. Yeah. Many suffer in silence. And one question asks, what advice do you have for those who won't come forward about their sexual assault, but want, want to heal? What should they do? Well, like Judge Aquilina said, um, looking for a therapist that's trauma informed. Um, and, and I think that, that that was one experience that did happen to us. We did our impact statements. Everyone saw us doing that. And then what? Uh, that, then who? who? How do you find somebody? How do you know who's trauma informed? Um, so first and foremost, finding out in your community, if you have an organization that does respond to sexual assaults because that's they typically have some sort some form of therapy or counseling sessions that they have that or somebody that they can recommend as a therapist that is is trauma informed um, it's never too late to report if you would like to um, it's never too late to get therapy it's never too late to um, sit in your space of trauma you can get there I think every day is every day I'm surviving so a little bit harder and some days are a little bit easier and some days I want to go to therapy because I feel like I can talk about it and other days I don't and today's one of those days where you push forward because um because you have to but want to get help even saying that you want to get help is step one step two is finding out in who your community what, what resources there are available and three seeing what at least a therapy space that you can get a little bit of support don't do it alone. In a related question that Dana poses, uh, particularly for Trine, but anyone can answer, how do you deal with people who don't believe that you were sexually assaulted? It's the gaslighting. What did, so 
uh, how do you cope with that? And what suggestions do you have for, for um, our participants here? Um, there's always be the, and if you tell somebody and they don't believe you, go to the next person. If they don't believe you, go to the next person because there is going to be somebody believe, that's going to believe you. And um, those are the people that you need to keep close to you because the people that don't believe you are not the ones. And, you know, I, again, I feel like that's a little bit of rape culture is the expectation that it was my fault that I wore this or that I was in that alley. Nobody has the right to assault you ever. That is not, that, that is their decision that they are making to assault you. It has nothing to do with your outfit or an alley or, I mean, you are targeted, unfortunately. So um, there's always going to be those non-believers. I, I've, I have faced many of them. Don't stop at them. Go to the next one. Go to the next one until you find somebody that does believe you. There's always people that don't believe. Even to this day, people don't believe the sister survivors were actually assaulted. I would say, as Trine said, keep going till you find somebody. Every client that contacts me, I think there's no reason they're going to contact me to make up a story. This is the truth. Who wants to put themselves through this? So I well, go. False reporting is really, it's like one in, I think it's 3% of reports are false reporting. And that is actually of the reports that are being reported of those assaults that are actually being reported. 3% false report. So that's why there should be no time limit on this, as yes, it indicated. Absolutely. It actually takes, I think, statistically to age 49 before people report for child abuse. You're talking about 30 years for them to cope with this. So when they finally come forward, find somebody to believe. Because let me tell you, there are people out there that will believe you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And false reporting, just to, since you all raised it, it is no greater. The, the numbers are exactly the same in rape as for any other crime for false reporting. And do mm -hmm. speak out until you are heard, until someone believes you. And here's what I always say. God put N and O in the alphabet for a reason. It spells <laughs> no. If someone, you know, that no motivates me every single time to change it to yes. Let it motivate you to get someone to listen and walk away from the naysayers. Thank you. And there are questions that, that I want to address about the structural changes that can be made, but a couple more relating to the human impact um, for judge, uh, for those in the legal field, like the judge and, and Mick, what's the mental impact on representing clients being the, the strong person in this process, but seeing these types of cases every day? How I, do you cope? I tell my staff and many of us, we, are, we actually go to therapy too. I mean, besides talking to each other, it is emotionally to tolling because you're lending part of your heart, at least when I practice to, to my clients and my friends and the people I care about. But you have to take care of yourself because if you don't, you're not doing your best. So therapy to go talk. I mean, therapy doesn't hurt anybody. I'm a true believer in therapy. I do a lot of self-care. I paint, I write, I sew, I do a lot of creative things, which takes me completely out of the, whatever trauma is going on in my courtroom. And I really try to hold it together in the courtroom, because if you go to the doctor in the emergency room and they look at your gash and they faint, um, you don't want that doctor. So, um, you know, I keep it together. It's what, you know, I hate to say we're used to seeing these things, but as professionals, I know Mick has seen hor horrific things. So have I. Um, we do our job. And I, I see there's a question that says, how did it feel to finally sentence Nasser? You know, it's, it's a double-edged sword because he is a human being. And I see a lot of really damaged human beings that I have to send to prison, some of them for life like him. It's not a good feeling um, because he is human after all. And I don't know what he suffered in his lifetime to bring him to this point. You have to wonder. But I also felt a sign of, uh, I felt relief for the girls, which is one of the reasons I said, I just signed your death warrant. It wasn't to be mean to him. It was to tell them he's never, ever getting out ever. And you are safe because they needed to know they were safe. So from my perspective, the sentencing, I try to have some healing on both sides, but especially in this case, so that the victims knew they were, they had now the whole world to thrive in because he was out of it. Judge, you also talked about your need to be impartial and, and fair to both sides. 
Uh, but one of the questions asked when you realized when he was giving his last minute statement, and he was turning around to address the victim. Uh, you admonished him to to look forward. Uh, so do you have an idea of what what his purpose was? And the other question is, how did it feel to finally sentence yeah. him? So um, he was turning around because he again, that was a power and control move. And I wasn't having any of it. He wanted that throughout the trial. And when he kept doing that, he wanted to say, oh, look at me. I'm so sorry. He wasn't sorry. He was sorry for himself. And it was really to control again. And I finally said, look at me. And there's no, no one who I sentence who gets to look around the room. They have to look forward. There's a certain decorum and he wanted to control it. And I didn't allow him to do that. And again, you know, when I sentenced him, I really felt relief, not for me, but for the community, for the sister survivors, their families, the doctors, this caused such a rippling effect of trauma throughout uh, the medical community, the Olympic community, the legal community, just so many um, rippling effects, negative. I felt like um, I'm relieving other people's uh, pain a little bit. Now we start the healing. And I really believe that a courtroom isn't just a place for punishment, but healing begins there. And no, I'm not a therapist. I just know that talking about your trauma publicly and confronting it is a huge step to healing. And you know, the Trine that I see today is this strong, powerful woman with a huge voice. She's come a long way. Right, Trine? <laughs> I have. Yes, I am right. a different person, and that's for sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm a different person. But it's it's in days. Some days I <laughs> some days I'm still struggling, but other days I'm ready to change the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, some of the questions, James' question talked about the institutional failures. What are the institutional solutions? We have the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. Um, it has an unlimited statute of limitations. Uh, we have Title IX. We have possible, we have the 2020 regulations and perhaps some new regulations under Biden. I don't know which way that's going to cut. And it's an international issue. Uh, we, our friend from from Australia is saying that Gymnastics Australia is also going under undergoing this type of review as well as, as British. We have the Olympics happening uh, th this year, we think um, in, in Tokyo. And so institutionally, what happened to USA Gymnastics? Yes, they all resigned, we have a new board, but, but did that help anything? How can we, how can we go from here? So I gotta be a little careful here. Because I, I, we're actually in mediation. But I can yeah. tell you that the changes that have been made at USAG are superficial changes, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, safe sport, I oppose it. The reason being is that when you go report to an organization internally, safe sport works for USAG. And in fact, I think about 90% of the complaints are dismissed. So you're looking at about 10% that they actually do something with. If you're going to report, you report out, you go to law enforcement, a neutral organization that will do their job. And as we said, if they don't listen, you go to the next law enforcement, whether it's the prosecutor's office, the attorney general's office, or the FBI, we have to report out. Now for an institution to change, they have to acknowledge first that something was done wrong. We have not seen, I mean, there's lip service, but they truly have to say something was done wrong, who did it, and what are they gonna put in place? And I would go, look at the people that were wronged, such as Trené and other survivors and ask them, what would they want there in place to help? What, what would they need to have another survivor come forward to tell their story? One of the good things that did happen in 2020 was the um, to get Gardner bill passed. It was signed into law, which is the empowering Olympic and Paralympic and Amateur Athletes Act of 2020. And in that, as part of that, uh, Congress can decertify US Olympic and Paralympic um, Committee and governing boards. But as part of that, I think, which should be across the nation in all these in sports all over is they have this committee, which now has eight athletes on it. They have an equal voice. And I think that's a huge up, but we need more of that. And we need anyone working with children because coaches are still not mandatory reporters. That blows me away. I don't understand why anybody who's working with children 
um, or the elderly or, or anyone who's handicapped. I don't know why we're all not mandatory reporters. What's the problem there? Because when we report, there's no negative effect there's, because otherwise it'd be a chilling effect. But when we report and we're right, you save a life. There needs to be mandatory training and then retraining in the military. I get trained and then I get retrained every single year or when there's something new. Why isn't that happening with sexual assault? And then I really have an issue with prosecutors not charging all of the offenses. Trinae said she was uh, assaulted hundreds of times. Why is there just one charge? There should be hundreds. And if Nasser would have been properly charged, it would send a rippling effect through the world. And they would have seen, you know, what, 10,000, 20,000, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of charges against him that they had evidence on. Why did they pick here and pick there? That, I think, is another assault on victims and takes away their voice. Let our system decide. And then also, we need to have it mandated, whether you're a bus driver, a priest, a Boy Scout leader, whoever you are. If you are accused of something, let the process work. You will get out of your job, we'll pay you on leave. You won't go to another school district or another town. You will simply, until there is a determination, you'll sit at home paid because otherwise this is how the, the bus drivers and the coaches and the teachers are continuing to assault because they just get moved around and pushed under the carpet. We can't stand for that. And I, and I would add education. You see you at Michigan State University University of Michigan, Ohio State, UCLA, USC, Baylor. One of these institutions should actually open up a center to study predators. And as a result of that, teach people about predators out there so it can go out to all institutions, not just higher education, but all institutions so we can learn about predators, protect ourselves from, from this. And hopefully if they do that, we won't have to see this type of trauma over and over again. Because that's what we're seeing. It's over and over. And as a judge said, you know, we have no uniformity in the law. How can somebody in right now in New York go file a case that's 20 years old and get some sort of criminal case going or a civil case? But here in Michigan, we can't do that. Or here in another state, we can't do that. That's just what and one of the per objectives of the Empowering and Safe Sport Act is to, and the U.S. Center for Safe Sport is to provide education and a hotline reporting mechanism that before it was, you you would report Nasser to the person who hired to Caroli or someone who, uh, who, who hired them and they have the self-interest. Um, and the due process questions, and Jama, this relates to your expertise in Title IX now, uh, and one of the questions talks about cross-examining the, um, the witnesses, the, the, so the complainants. So uh, in terms of the procedural, and in safe sport, those cases go to arbitration. The criminal cases are still within the criminal context, but within USA Gymnastics and within the sport, um, there's, there's mandatory arbitration. So I'm wondering if, and it's individual arbitration. And so I'm wondering if you still get the sense of having your day in court, if there's that empowering impact um, when it's, they don't, they're not quite sure if you report it out to, uh, to the criminal authorities. I actually disagree because I have clients that have reported to Safe Sport and things have been turned down or it takes a year for them to reply. It's to me an organization where you're reporting to yourself. That's like there's a complaint here in my law office and they come to me and I'm the one that's supposed to judge it. You need to go out, go out to a third party, go to law enforcement. I, I, I can't stress enough that you should go to law enforcement. But do you think there's any way, though, with additional funding that we could make safe sport into something that would be useful? Yes, I do. I think if it's done properly and you get input from survivors and they can believe that they're actually going to be heard. But when they're sitting there being judged, cross-examined, and you have an arbitrator, I don't think they get a fair shot because our culture hasn't changed yet. Right. People, they're just not believed right now. And I'm going to use gymnastics as the example. In safe sport for gymnastics, the change has not occurred. I mean, okay. look at Simone. She yeah. is the number one gymnast in the entire world ever, of all time. 
and she would not put her child, if she were to have one at this state, in the sport of gymnastics. End do you, of story. you agree with that? Would you put your child in gymnastics? You know, the sport to me was me. I loved it. It was amazing. I would flip. I My mom put me in gymnastics, so I didn't mm -hmm. break my head open on a table. And I flourished. It was the most beautiful sport. At this stage, I also would absolutely not put my child in the sport of gymnastics because nothing has changed. Nothing. So no. Maureen, back to the students. No. <laughs> oh. Down. <laughs> well, Jamie, I know, I know, Jamie, you have many questions. Are there any others you'd like to ask for? Because we just have a few more minutes. So I want to make sure you get a chance. Well, I, I guess I'd like to stay on this issue of, of what can we do of uh, solutions? You know, is there anything um, that you would change in the institutions, whether it's uh, uh, USAG or the Olympic Committee or the centers, centers uh, for Safe Sport or in the college um, arena with respect to Title IX. What, what would you ideally want those institutions to do differently and better? Well, I, I also, I mean, I disagree right now with the Title IX process where victim survivors are cross-examined. I mean, mm -hmm. in essence, what you're doing is you're re-victimizing them right there and that's for a Title IX violation where this actually is better situated to be investigated outside the university or outside USA Gymnastics or outside the Olympic Committee. The, the organization that enabled this to happen can't be the one judging it. It just, that can't happen. That doesn't give a fair shot to the victim survivor. Right. And do you think they really wanna tell their story to be re-victimized again? They're already not believed to begin with. And it, it can mess up a criminal case because the more that a victim has to tell their story, now under cross-examination, there's well, you told it differently this time and this time, they get confused. The, the information gets contaminated, especially if they're young. They're, they need to be questioned first and foremost, and maybe only by a forensic, someone who's, tra who's trained specifically in forensic questioning. 100% agree, Judge. 100%. And, and we've touched oh. on this, but what, what is the most effective thing that the audience, either individually or collectively, can do right now? You've touched on some things about, you know, getting different legislation, believing survivors. I mean, but do you have any co real concrete examples to end with? I, I actually believe there are many organizations out there that support survivors not just sexual assault, but just assault in general. If you, want, if you want to learn about it, talk to these organizations, become educated. You become educated, you can educate your family, your parents, brothers, sisters, even your children. This is all about education. This is not an easy fix, JMO. This is gonna take time. I firmly believe this is like a decade long project. If you recall, when the Penn State victims came forward, sadly, they, they were believed because they were men. But at that time period, uh, that was like the beginning of the Me Too movement. Then you had the sister survivors, they were believed. Baylor survivors, not even right now, U of M survivors aren't being believed. But you saw a little change with Weinstein. You saw a little change when Cosby was charged the second time. So change is happening, but it's slow. So all we can do is we, we have to advocate we need people like Crene and the judge that allows victims to come forward and speak and civil attorneys to continue to fight because we're going to get to a day where everybody's believed. But in the meanwhile, if you know someone, I, you know, I think everybody knows somebody who's been raped, um, who's been gone through domestic violence and the whole arena. Well, also two organizations. Um, Can you hear me? You're frozen, Trinae. You're frozen, Trinae. What I was going to say is, for those people, if you know someone who's been raped or who needs help, be there. I, yeah, can you guys hear me at all? Yeah, now we can. Trinae? I think we've lost her. 
Anyways, if someone has been raped, be their support person. Don't grill them. Let them tell you their story oh. in their own time and be a friend to them and get them the help they need and don't pressure them in any way. And that's really one of the biggest things that you can do is just be there for them. Uh, let them have their triggers, see how you can get them help, uh, believe them and go on the journey with them and let them be their own hero. There's nothing that you can do to prod them along or to them get for them to get over it, but you can be a good support person. Yeah. Sorry, Trina, you're going in and out. I don't know what's happening. Can you guys hear me? Now yeah. we can. Yay. Hi, sorry. I know we only have a few minutes or, or we're over time, but um, there are organizations like ours that are doing education. Education is so key to this topic and to change. So when we're even talking about five-year-olds, how to recognize and how to teach five-year-olds to understand what safe touch is, who their safe people are. There should be five in each child's life. I mean, it's as simple as things like that. Organizations like the United States Olympic Committee for Education and training the, the coaches, the staffing, the event planners. I mean, there's so much that can be done. It's where education, I mean, all, even with the law prof or the professors, you all know that education is key. This is the place where we can make a difference. And there are organizations, I mean, we are launching an Avalon Institute, which is exactly like this, to teach attorneys how to be trauma-informed, to teach first responders, to teach judges, and in things like that, they don't even understand what neurobiology of the mind is. So how, how trauma survivors respond, what does that look like? If they're laughing, is that a trauma response? Yes, it is. So, but most of us would look at laughing as a, as they're joking, this is a joke to them. That's not the case. That's, that's one of the three behaviors of neurobiology of the mind of trauma. So it's education. And, and I, I could go off on a tangent again, and I, I don't mean to do that, but there <clears throat> are organizations that are willing to help you and to train you on these kind of things. So we exist. Yep. Thank you. That's well, that's, that that's the perfect note to uh, end this conversation for now, but we get, are going to keep continuing this conversation and supporting each other. I appreciated the questions and comments. I appreciated the students and the Sports Lawyers Association members for participating today. And thank you to Judge Aquilina, Mick, Trune and my friend Jema for a very powerful and informative discussion. Yeah. So um, everyone heal and uh, speak up. Self care, self care. Thank you. Self care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Conversation going. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you.